Well, hello there. My name is Paul Kearney. Uh, I'm a professor of politics and public policy at the University of Stirling. And this is a lecture that I was going to give to a couple of places. Uh, and the audience was going to be a sort of global health or public health students uh, from University of Aberdeen and University of Stirling. And I was going to turn up and give a couple of lectures and I was going to find out about uh, what people were studying and what they found interesting. And, you know, if you give some of these lectures, you know, you kind of feed off your audience. It can be quite enjoyable. Uh, but I'm sure you, you'll agree that the alternative here, which is to sort of do it on my own in a spare room, uh, trying to be quiet because uh, I'm self-conscious, there's people in the house. I'm sure you can agree that that's almost as good. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the kinds of discussions that I would have discussed in person. And some of it would have been interactive. So what I need you to do is to sort of pretend you're interacting with me when you go through this. OK, I know it's not going to work unless you do that, so I'm going to trust you. OK, so bear in mind my audience was public health, global health, health science, you know, and so these these questions really resonate in some fields. Uh, so some people do ask themselves or they want to find out why don't policymakers listen to my evidence? Or, you know, there, there are variants of this question that I've tried to answer over the over the years and months, which is, you know, why don't they listen to the best evidence? Or why don't they listen to scientific evidence? Something like that. And usually people have in mind a particular type of evidence that is more useful than others. Okay. The second thing that, that you know this audience often wants to work out is why are only some public health policies successful? You know, so um, often, for example, tobacco is seen as a relative success story now, and often seen as a model, but more kind of broader preventive policies or you know health equity policies are are often not seen as successful. So those are kind of two kind of complementary questions that, that people often ask. Okay. Now throughout, I think what I'll do is I'll pause occasionally to wipe the, the sweat off my brow because I've had to keep the, the window closed to uh, keep the noise down. All right, that's better. Any questions so far? All right, so let's go to part one. Part one involves me asking you questions just to work out what your views are on these four questions. Okay, so normally I would give uh, you would be in groups. Imagine this. Imagine you're in groups sitting next to, sitting less than two meters from your peers, and you can ask yourself these questions. Okay, so it might be worth pausing the slide so you can give a, a good answer to these questions before we continue. Okay, now if you didn't pause there, you, you know you're only you're only cheating yourself. Okay, so let's go through the kinds of answers that I sometimes expect to get from the kind of audience I describe. Okay, so so the answer to what is good research evidence? And how do you gather it? Now that question is is I designed to try and um, identify a tendency within some subjects or approaches to talk about a hierarchy of evidence, and at the top of the hierarchy. You have the randomized control trial and at the very top, the um, systematic review of randomized control trials. Somewhere further down, other types of research, then further down, you have uh, expertise and then very far down, you have things like um, you know, practical experience, service user experience, uh, professional experience, that sort of thing. And it's there to sort of tease out the assumptions that people make about what, what is good, good evidence and bad evidence. And some people relate it to methods. And then I would say in some other fields, people flip that hierarchy on its head and they favor experiential uh, uh, knowledge, uh, you know, knowledge from the field, uh, relationships, relationship or relational knowledge and such like. Okay, so the second question would be what other knowledge is relevant? Well, if you adhere to a hierarchy, some people will, will say, okay, well, I recognize that if we're trying to co-produce uh, 
knowledge or policy, then we need to incorporate knowledge or views from other people. Now, as soon as you do that, question three is how do you put it all together to make policy evidence based and quotations or evidence informed? Now, you know, I guess you probably wouldn't come up with an answer to that question because phrases like evidence based, they sound intuitive until you think about them. And when you think about them, you really wonder what that could possibly mean or hope, hopefully you wonder what that could possibly mean. And normally I would say, you know, if, when I would study politics as an undergraduate or postgraduate, the word evidence didn't even come up. You know, it was, uh, we might have talked about information or rationality or something like that. But, you know, evidence-based is, is often a phrase, I think, associated with, you know, things like evidence-based medicine and such like. Then question four is a good one because some people think of themselves as objective scientists looking for the truth, speaking truth to power and such like. Okay. And usually I would say that's a nonsense. You know, everyone is a, a political actor okay. in that they have their own preferences. Their preferences uh, compete with uh, preferences of other people and they seek ways to, you know, fulfill their own at the expense of other people's. You know, as soon as you do that kind of thing, as soon as you're making choices about who, um, you know, what you should be doing with evidence and, and who should be involved in that sort of thing. You know, these are these are political choices. Okay. So. Well, let's just smile at the way I've, I've uh, phrased that. So keep, keep your answers in your head uh, and I'll relate them to three kind of broad explanations for a lack of so-called evidence based policymaking or even evidence informed policymaking. OK, so the first answer in general is that um, people have different and competing ideas about what counts as good evidence. And the way I've phrased it here is that policymakers often have different ideas compared to some scientists or some researchers. OK, so that's the sort of thing we would, we would discuss in groups. You know, how do you produce and then reconcile very different ways of thinking about what counts as good evidence. And so, do, so I mean, I think part of the point here is that uh, I think people are quite quick to decide that if policymakers don't pay attention to the evidence that they like, then that's something wrong with politics of policymakers. And sometimes it's really just a, a, a competition or a difference in views about what should count and what's policy relevant. Okay. Now, the second thing in brackets there is that uh, when you look at policy processes, uh, you, you sort of move from the, the, the assumption that there's a small and identifiable number of policymakers towards the idea that there are many spread across different levels of government and, and types of government. OK, so that really just kind of um, amplifies the extent to which uh, the lack of so-called evidence based policymaking can simply relate to the fact that there are huge numbers of people involved and you'll have different ideas about what counts as good evidence. So, of course, there are going to be these gaps between the ways in which some people think of evidence and what the result policies are. OK, the second explanation. I like to put it like this because it seems counterintuitive until we think about it. You know, they, they have to ignore almost all evidence. Or another way to put it is, all people have to ignore almost all evidence almost all of the time. OK, there's, there's, an, there's an almost infinite amount of information out there in the world, and we only have a finite uh, way and means to collect and process it. So we have to find ways to ignore almost all of it. Now, uh, in, in sort of policy studies or, you know, in, in uh, you know, psychology and management and such like, there is this phrase, comprehensive rationality, which uh, describes an ideal type uh, which is uh, if you imagine someone or some organization with the ability to collect and process all available information. Now, I call it an ideal type because it doesn't exist. It's something there to compare with the real world. Okay. So instead, we compare it with this other phrase, bounded rationality, which is uh, almost a truism. You know, people do not have the means to process all information available to them. So they use two shortcuts to produce enough attention to enough information. Uh, now, these are provocative terms. OK, they're not. That's why I put them in quotation marks. OK, so the first one is so-called rational or, you know, uh, using reason. So people set goals, they identify the best sources of information and that helps them reduce uncertainty. 
okay they're they're finding ways to find the right information to sort of fill gaps in their knowledge say uh, or to you know uh, you know do things the other way around the other the other phrase is irrational which describes uh, the ways in which people they go with their gut they go with habits they go with their emotions uh, they use their beliefs uh, and those are all ways to make very quick decisions based on a, a very efficient amount of information and the word that's missing there is, is ambiguity so look at look at the difference between those terms uh, they're looking to do two things one is to reduce uncertainty which is not enough information about something the other is to reduce ambiguity which is to reduce a huge amount of different ways that you could think about a policy problem into one okay so you reduce ambiguity by clarifying the meaning and in politics and policy making that means you clarify the meaning by exercising power to uh, focus on one way of seeing the world or seeing a policy problem within it Okay, third explanation. They do not control the policy process. It is not a simple policy cycle or a set of linear stages. So what I would normally do is I would say, look at look on the left hand side there. There is a kind of uh, the, the a kind of one of the most simple renditions of a policy cycle or a series of stages. So uh, the the best way to think about this cycle is to think of it as a set of functional requirements. These are the things that policymakers might think they need to do to turn an idea into a, a, you know, a, a solution that they can they can consider. Okay, so again, you know, so they, they, they define a problem, agenda setting stage, they identify solutions, choose a solution, they legitimate that through you know, parliament or referendum, something like that. They allocate resources, implement policy, then they evaluate and then they consider if they should keep going or change it or, or close it down. Okay, so Think of that not as a natural description of what happens, but as a set of requirements you would identify sensibly if you thought, how, how can I turn a problem into an, an outcome? And the comparison is with more uh, messy processes. So in the top right, I would say, well, you know, can you tell me what this is? And you would say, uh, I don't know. Or you would say, is it uh, and a sort of electrical system in Thailand? And I would say, you're quite, you're quite right, well done. And so I think the idea there is I quite like this image because it looks really messy and it looks kind of dangerous and that sort of thing, but it actually works. You know, energy goes in, energy goes out. And look at how similar that is to the um, the graph I've got below in the bottom right that I'm kind of standing in front of. And you get the idea. That's a kind of that's a that's a messy system too. Now I like this. This was produced by people in the European Commission. Now the the significance there is that. Um, European Commission and your parts of the UK government were kind of known traditionally for presenting the idea that they produce policy in a cycle or a series of stages. And here we have parts of that kind of government saying, well, this is actually a much messier process. And, you know, we, you know, it's, it's very hard to know how it works. And therefore, it's very difficult to know the role of evidence within it. OK, so your third explanation for why you wouldn't expect evidence-based policy making is that it's not quite um, it's that easy to work out what policy making is. So if that was true, how could you expect it to, there to be this kind of linear relationship between evidence and policy? Okay, so then you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's all well and good, or not, it's up to you. Uh, but you might think, well, uh, it doesn't help me work out what to do or it doesn't really you know that projection of mess doesn't really help me understand what that process is and so what I've been trying to do with this kind of picture is to produce an image that is as pleasing as the policy cycle one but more useful in terms of um, you know helping people understand uh, or or analyze policy processes to try and work out what the role of evidence might be so you can imagine uh, I mean, this might seem a bit sad, but I'm, I'm trying to actually produce a picture that is very pleasing to the eye and comforting. So it should kind of look like a bit like a blue turtle. That's, I mean, fair enough, it's on, it's in a little bit of distress because it's uh, upside down. Uh, but I suppose you could imagine that you're looking at it from a, you know, a glass floor or something like that. Okay, so 
the, the point would be in the middle you have this kind of uh, representation of bounded rationality or the psychology of choice so that is people finding ways to process just enough information to make choices. They're surrounded by a policy-making environment that's summed up by these five concepts as follows. Okay, so actors describes the fact that there are many policymakers and influencers spread across many levels and types of government. Okay, so the first thing to work out, first thing to work out, in fact, let me just work out what the next slide is. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Oh no, I can't get back to it. Okay, well this is embarrassing. I so I've moved to the next slide and I can't move back again. Okay, so I could stop it and start again, but I probably would lose the whole thing. So I'm just gonna continue and ask you to remember that slide before. Okay. So uh, if you imagine we were actors, okay, so the next one was institutions. And institutions are the formal and informal rules that guide practices within organisations. OK, so the formal ones are written down and they're well understood. OK, so you can think of legislation or constitutions and such like. But the informal ones are the ones that are, are possibly more important. So they are unwritten. They are often in the minds of individuals and they are very difficult to pick up. So imagine uh, what you need to do to sort of uh, improve the use of evidence within policy making is to work out what these rules are. The more you understand the rules, the more you can present evidence. But you know, easier easier said than done if they only exist in the minds of individuals. Okay, the third concept is networks, and those are the relationships between policymakers and influencers. Okay, so uh, you know, put simply, you might say policymakers put a lot of trust in the, the messenger, if they know the messenger, if they um, have worked with them before, if they share their beliefs, so they've proven reliable and such like. So, so these networks between actors are very important. And so the, you know, the, if you were looking to improve the use of evidence with your evidence, a big part of that would be forming relationships with policymakers rather than simply sending them things and expecting them to, to pay attention. The fourth one, if I can remember, is uh, it describes socio-economic context. Let's say that's the fourth one, and that would suggest that um, you know most issues that arise are not in the control of policymakers, and policymakers do not have the ability to control those things. So imagine, you know, things like um, uh, our current situation. You know, imagine the extent to which governments could be in control of the spread of a virus or the resultant economic crisis and such like. Okay, so these these uh, factors are important uh, and not under control of policymakers. And the final one would be ideas. So in every sort of uh, policymaking venue or uh, institution or network, you have a dominant set of beliefs that guide practices, and sometimes they're so dominant that they're taken for granted. So, you know, in, um, in some fields, people take for granted a hierarchy of evidence or a kind of focus on evidence. In some places, they have an expectation that really their focus is value for money. OK, and, uh, you know, to, to understand how people process evidence, you would have to understand the, the, the ways in which they, they think about their, their wider task or how they relate evidence to that wider context. OK, so we're back to the proper slide. Now, I, I like this slide, although it's too um, too many words. Now, that's not a problem today. Norm normally, I give this presentation in front of people and I say, you know, don't read the words, just listen to the voice. Uh, but I guess you can pause it and take all the time you like. Now, the point about this slide is that it, it invites you to imagine three different ways to pursue evidence-informed Policy making or, or governance. Okay. And the point is each of the three are internally consistent, but at least two of them contradict each other. Okay. So that's the that's the sort of big take home point. You know, choose the one you want, uh, and recognize that you can't choose them all. Or I mean some governments do kind of try and juggle them all, but look at the contradictions here. So let, let's go through each of these kind of stories. 
uh, in relation to three questions. First question, how should you gather evidence? Now with approach one, which I sometimes call implementation science, although if you get uh, someone in the audience will often tell me I'm wrong to call it that. OK, but that is a kind of a, f a broad field in which people are trying to work out how to translate uh, the best evidence into practice and to sort of close the gap, the notional gap between uh, you know, production of evidence and, and the practice. And so often uh, people in this field will say, OK, how do you gather evidence? Well, uh, with relation to the hierarchy of evidence that I talked about and to use uh, randomized control trials as much as possible. If so, then you ask, how should you scale up for best practice? Well, the idea is you produce a uniform model for two reasons. One is that you've you've um, you've tested that model through the randomized control trial. And the other is you want to continue to evaluate things. So you have to have a high degree of fidelity to the intervention or the dosage so that you can measure its effect again and again and accumulate knowledge based on that. If so, what aim should you prioritize? Well, it's about administering, well, at least in medicine, it's about administering the right active ingredient in sort of health or social services. It's about the equivalent to the correct dosage. So the kind of um, classic example is the family nurse partnership where there's a kind of notional dosage of the number of hours you would receive under the, under the process. Now let's compare that with, uh, I would say an equally valid way to uh, gather and process knowledge. And I'm calling that one storytelling. Okay, so how do you gather evidence? Well, you share stories based on practitioner experience and knowledge and, and feedback from service users. If so, how do you scale up best practice? Well, in this kind of approach, there isn't really a, a kind of a uniform sense of best practice. Instead, you, you tell stories about what you've done and you invite people to learn from them and to adopt those, adapt those lessons to their context. Third question, what aim should you prioritize? Well, in this case, it would be governance principles, uh, localism, respect for service users. Uh, you know, um, so for example, Kind of classic model is, is to use this um, approach in care homes and it's sort of respect for uh, care home users in, in the ways in which they gather knowledge to, you know, to change practices. Now, as you imagine, those, those two um, approaches, they're internally consistent, but they, they're not, they, they kind of subvert each other. And you could try and juggle both of them, but it would be a very kind of weird uh, mix. Now, the third one is, to some extent, uh, uh, an attempt to uh, produce the best of both worlds here. So in terms of gathering evidence, well, you try and produce a mix of evidence. And the point is you train practitioners in an improvement method. You encourage them to experiment and evaluate their own um, practices. So you give them some evidence of what you think works. And then you, you, you tell them to go off and try and adapt to this, those, their context. So in terms of scaling up, well, there's kind of simple maxim. If you if it's working, keep doing it. If it's not, stop. And then the thing that is missing, what aim should you prioritize? Now, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm almost certain that you prioritize the method and the practices, the local experimentation, more than the kind of um, RCT approach. And also in a more systematic or more centralized manner than the storytelling approach. Okay, but even then there are different different models. Okay, well, I mean, let's stop for, maybe you want to go for a little walk around. Let's stop for 10, 15 minutes. Whew, all right, good break then. Okay, so let's uh, move on to part two. Uh, so you imagine the context is that kind of evidence-based policymaking is not as, as simple as you might hope. Uh, and you know, we're trying to relate that to uh, experiences in particular case studies like public health. OK, so uh, here are the sort of questions we would ask ourselves. So um, you know, people want to know why are some policy, uh, you know, policy uh, interventions more successful than others? Uh, they, sort, they sort of want to know how they can improve the use of evidence, so have it win the day. And maybe we can make some comparisons. I think there's a good comparison to be made between something quite specific like tobacco control and something much broader and harder to pin down like uh, prevention. Okay, so let's make that a comparison. 
So the first thing we do if we're trying to think through these questions is to ask ourselves what actually is policy success? So um, in the background there, there's this excellent book uh, called Great Policy Successes, and it goes through a series of case studies, and it's and it's uh, it's like it's a um, it's an open open access book, so you can fairly you can find it fairly easily, I think, online through Oxford University Press. And so the chapter I did on that was about treating UK tobacco policy as a success, uh, but the would encourage us to think about success in three very different terms. Okay, the first is what is often called programmatic, which is that it's successful in terms of the extent to which the government produced a comprehensive package of policy instruments. Now, there's a kind of common argument within tobacco control that to really reduce smoking in the population, you have to combine a package of policy measures. And the UK is one of the countries that has adopted that package comprehensively. So that would include things like a banning on smoking in public places, a ban on tobacco advertising and um, uh, plain packaging and um, high taxation and such like. Okay, so it's so it's successful in those terms, in terms of uh, policy change, the, the, the size of it. Then you might say it's successful, possibly, possibly in terms of process. So a sort of process success describes the extent to which there was uh, useful or valuable engagement with stakeholders, interest groups, citizens to produce that kind of policy. Now, I put a question mark there because, well, hang on, I'll just wait for the motorbikes to go past. Hang on. All right, off they go. I was so sure it was going to be dogs barking and it would interrupt us, but it was motorbikes. Okay, so process. I put a question mark there because I think if you work in public health or you are, you are for tobacco control, you would describe this as a, as a good process. I think if you were against tobacco control and you were maybe uh, working for tobacco companies or, or other uh, groups in that field, you would say that they've largely been excluded from the, uh, the process to produce these policies. And in fact, tobacco is quite unusual in that uh, the sort of WHO stipulation that tobacco companies are not engaged in formal policy processes. Now, the third one is political success. And in this case, I would say uh, policy in the UK was successful because it is very hard to imagine a major U-turn on U UK tobacco policy. Okay, it's it's here to stay, and it's uh, successful in its longevity. Now there are some one or two countries where they have sort of reversed or slowed down policy change, but the UK is kind of characterised largely by the introduction of um, you know kind of um, high impact measures and the maintenance or um, accumulation of those measures. So those are, those are the three ways in which you might say that tobacco policy in the UK has been successful in those terms. Now, if we use those measures, we can, we can think, um, what's the comparison with broader prevention policies? Now, I should say that the first thing we should work out is to say, what, what exactly is a, a prevention policy? And it's, that's actually quite difficult to answer that. Um, Generally, you would say it connects to an idiom, you know, prevention is better than cure. So, for example, let's intervene in the lives of people as early as possible to ward off outcomes that you could have prevented. And sometimes people make a distinction between primary, secondary and tertiary prevention. So primary would often be whole population measures in which it's the same basic intervention. So think of like health based inoculation which is you know, more difficult to do in, in social policies. And then you might have secondary prevention, which is to identify at risk or high risk groups and intervene as early as possible. And tertiary prevention would be identifying groups that uh, are um, experiencing poor outcomes and to prevent them getting worse. Okay, and often people talk about a sort of a, a cliff edge analogy in which um, you're much better to put up a fence on the cliff than to treat people if, if, you know, at the bottom, that sort of thing. Okay, very unfortunate metaphor, but um, you know, it's a very kind of broad area we're talking about, and I think that's that's part of the issue that we're we're talking about here. In tobacco, you can identify a very specific aim, a very specific definition of the problem. You know, this is a global pandemic, a, a major cause of non-communicable disease. Whereas with prevention, it's much more difficult to pin down what it is. And, 
who's responsible and such like. Okay, so if you relate that to these measures of success, you would say it's difficult to identify the same programmatic success because it, with prevention or public health prevention or wider preventive measures, they're mostly strategy documents that you find. You know, they, they, they set out first principles and aims, and it's much more difficult to relate those aims to very specific policy instruments. The second is process. So if you remember, that was about a successful way to uh, engage with stakeholders to produce policies that people agree with. Now, in this case, it's much more difficult to identify who the stakeholders would be because prevention tends to be something that can be done by anyone across government and, and so many groups could be involved. So, you know, if, if anyone can be responsible, then often no one is responsible. And the third is political success. Now, I think it's characterised by high commitment. So lots of governments, so in, in our case, it was UK and Scottish government, Lots of governments show this high political commitment, uh, but there's relatively low follow through. It's a bit like um, if you look at studies of health and all policies, they, they tend to identify this importance of high level political will or strategic um, commitment, but real problems with implementation. Now we'd say here, if we go back to that uh, picture that we lost a few slides ago, we can use it to help explain the, the types of differences I've just talked about. OK. And you can do it in, in three different ways here. OK, so three conditions. The first condition is use evidence to persuade policymakers to pay attention to and shift their understanding of policy problems. Now, with tobacco, what you saw in the post-war period in countries like the UK is a shift from seeing tobacco as a positive and economic good to be supported with you know, trade policies and um, you know, uh, good relationships with the government towards treating it as the contributor to one of the most preventable causes of, of uh, death and non-communicable disease. Okay, so the scientific evidence on the harms of smoking and environmental tobacco smoke were instrumental uh, in shifting policymaker attention to the problems of tobacco. Now, you just don't find that in the same way with prevention. OK, so it's very difficult. You can see a sort of notional shift towards prevention within governments, but it's, it's less easy to put your fingers on the kind of evidence that people would use to underpin that kind of initiative. And it's very difficult to connect that evidence to an, a shift of an understanding of a problem. It's just, it's just far more vague. You know, you just got a less of a sense of a, a real focused problem definition with prevention. Now, the second is uh, make sure the policy environment is conducive to policy change. Now, that that's we can go through the um, the little turtle there to help us explain the the difference in their policy environments. Okay, so think with with tobacco. Um, now, if you look at things like institutions, now there's a big shift in the rules to uh, think about what the problem is and to gather evidence of it when departments of health became responsible. Think about a shift in responsibility from a treasury or a trade department towards a department of health. Okay, suddenly their rules suggest there's, there's a, there's, there's a, there are different ways to gather evidence. There are sources of evidence are public health and medical. The people they consult with on a daily basis are public health and medical. So there's a real shift there. Um, their ideas shift, so their um, the kind of common understandings or the dominant understandings of the problem are very different if, if health departments are in charge. And then look at uh, things like socioeconomic uh, context and events. Now, I think there are three big uh, socioeconomic conditions with tobacco. One is that, um, and they've all kind of uh, changed. So. Um, opposition to tobacco control has gone down in the post-war period. The contribution of tobacco taxation to the Treasury has gone down. And there's a third thing, I'm going to pause while I remember. And of course, the number of smokers has gone down. OK, so you imagine there's been a real shift in socioeconomic conditions with tobacco and they're kind of, they, they're kind of mutually reinforcing, you know, the, the number uh, of uh, smokers and the contribution of tax goes down, that makes it more um, conducive to uh, tobacco control and tobacco control 
then reduces, uh, helps reduce the number of smokers and the economic contribution. Now with prevention, it's just more difficult to find the same sense that there's a more conducive to policy change, policy environment. Okay, so there are many actors kind of spread across uh, many different departments. It's very difficult, therefore, to know what the rules are and how to uh, you know, influence policy. It's the same with, with networks. There's a huge number of different networks, some of which are kind of complementary and some of which contradict each other. There are many competing sources of ideas that are going on and the you know, socioeconomic conditions are, are very difficult to, to identify. So it's a much messier process with a, a broader shift or strategic shift to prevention. And again, I would say it's the same with initiatives like health and all policies, you know, because, uh, you know, one of the conditions of, of health and all policies is that, uh, you know, most health relevant choices are made in non-health sectors. Then as soon as you make that conclusion, you think, well, there's, there's a whole load of different institutions and networks and understandings it can, interacting with each other in, in kind of, um, you know, complex ways compared to tobacco, where there's a kind of increasing sense that there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of focus of power. The third condition is that people, policymakers, exploit individual windows of opportunity. Now, I think the phrase window of opportunity is quite popular within health studies, and some people are, are kind of aware of relating that to Kingdon and, and you know, so-called multiple streams analysis. Now, in a nutshell, and you can follow this up in some, some blogs, uh, a window of opportunity describes what happens when three things come together at the same time. So policymaker attention rises to a policy problem and a particular way to think about a policy problem. Okay, so imagine attention has risen to the problem of the effects of smoking in the, public, the population. The second is a solution already exists and it's technically feasible and politically feasible. Now, technically feasible means it will work as intended if implemented. Politically feasible means enough people in positions of power are willing to support it. And the third thing that, that happens is policymakers have the motive and opportunity to select this policy solution. All those three things come together during this window of opportunity, it makes it much more likely that you know, policy change will happen. Okay. Now, the point is that uh, what tobacco control shows us is that this is not a singular window of opportunity. This is a collection of individual windows to adopt uh, a whole package of different measures. So uh, if you look at the UK experience, there was a window of opportunity at one date to uh, raise the, the, the price of tobacco uh, by a lot. There was a separate window of opportunity to uh, ban smoking in public places. There was a separate window of opportunity to ban tobacco advertising and, and uh, promotion, and a separate window of opportunity to uh, introduce plain packaging and such like. Okay, so that was a kind of um, a succession of different opportunities. Now, I think in contrast, prevention is often seen as a single window of opportunity to adopt a strategy. And to some extent, you see that with health and all policies as well. You know, there's a big focus on the, an opportunity to introduce a strategic document or commitment. And that's very different from the adoption of, of a succession of very specific policy instruments. Okay, well, that's it. Um, normally, we would uh, stop for a break and some questions. I think we're all gonna, we were planning to have a cup of coffee and then uh, talk some more. Uh, I guess that's not possible, uh, but you can see here's my details. Uh, I suppose I, you know, if you wanna get in touch or you've got questions, then, you know, ideally send me an email and I'm happy to respond to your emails or questions whenever you like. Okay, otherwise you can find me there on, on Twitter and you can also find most of this stuff on my website. And if you click on, there are sections called 500, 750 or 1000. They're little explainers of public policy and policy analysis. So feel free to, to follow those things up. Okay, thank you. <laughs>